This conference will now be recorded. Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, Freak, uh, like I was just saying earlier, this uh, go to meeting is a bit, uh, it's first time for us on this platform. Freak, can you just load that um, presentation and share? It is now. Okay, um, good evening, everybody. Um, once again, um, extreme thanks to the PWI for approaching us and giving us this opportunity to at least um, introduce tubular, the tubular modular track system. Um, this is a very basic introduction just to let the guys see what it is. And, um, you know, once uh, technical aspects need to be addressed, that can be done. <clears throat> through the PWR individually, um, through Freck and myself um, in, in the near future or after the production, after the presentation. So um, just to give you a brief highlight before we move on, um, what is tubular track and where did it evolve? Um, the inventor of the system is a guy by the name of Peter Kissel. Um, he's a German born South African. Um, he got his civil engineer degree in the early 60s and then joined those days South African Railways and Harbors, Transnet. Um, he then worked for them and went into private uh, track uh, companies at the later stage. And around about 1987, 88, um, he had some colleagues that were in the mines and they, they had a drainage problem underground. Because as a, you know, most of the mines are very wet and there's drainage problems. So, um, he came up, up with this idea just to uh, create two beams that there can be a center drain uh, running down the middle of the track, uh, which then runs to the shaft and into the pumping system. So he did a bit of uh, R&D and got the system going. And in 1989, um, he approached all the big, the big boys that were involved in the mining in South Africa, which was then a thriving uh, uh, economy in this country, and a company called Basil Reed mining then adopted the system and uh, they had a very large footprint in the mining industry and the tubular track it was called rocam r-o-c-a-m those days and um, it took off in the mining industry um, and still is involved in the mining industry in south africa and um, currently we've finished our project in canada and we're still busy in russia so um uh, at that stage, um, we, we reckon we've got about six, 700 kilometers in the mining industry in South Africa. Um, we lost count. Um, when, the, when the system started, it was, a, it was a system that was pumped in situ. So uh, the, the longitudinal beams underneath the rail were pumped in various sections of 20, 30, 40, 50 meters, depending on uh, the work that we had to do over the weekend and the time we had available. Um, subsequent, uh, around about uh, in the early 90s, um, or around about 94, 95, um, quality assurance and quality issues became a problem um, with the guys pumping the stuff underground because, um, you know, every site was doing a different mix and the, the strengths were becoming a problem. And at that stage, um, we thought out the box and we came up with the idea to go modular. And uh, then, um, so since 94, 95, the, the system is modular. It's pumped in a factory under strict QA um, conditions and then taken to site and installed um, appropriately. Um, in 92, 93, um, the system started migrating to surface. And um, subsequent, well, as things stand now, we do more work on surface than in the underground, but we, we still do it above ground and, and, and on surface. So the system was was born in the end of 88, 89, and um, you know it's still going and it's modular now. Okay, so so we'll in this presentation we'll just very briefly look at what is tubular modular track. We'll look at a very simple manufacturing process, um, the installation, some advantages uh, from a cost point of view and logistical point of view. Uh, we'll do some very basic cost comparisons. Uh, it's just tables. Um, 
it's not definitive and then um, there's a bunch of applications including photographs to get to give everybody the idea of what we do and where we've done it okay so in, in principle tubular monitor track is a is a reinforced concrete ballastless ballastless beam track um, it is not pre-stressed um, we use self-compacting grout which we pump in it's a small aggregate concrete uh, we can manufacture any track gauge, very simple. Um, modules are cast upside down in the molds um, to ensure absolute continuous rail support and very stringent tolerances. Uh, we can vary our module lengths um, from three to six meters. Generally in the underground mining environment, we go three meters because of the transportation constraints, constraints getting it down the, the shaft and then up to six meters um, on, on surface. Um, FREA um, pretty much determines the length of the modules based on axle load and and uh, wheel spacing on the wagons because that plays a, a integral role in, in the length of the module. Um, all our steel components, which we refer to as gauge bars and stirrups, are hot dip galvanized to ensure longevity. Um, we, as a rule in South Africa, we use the pan roll fastener because that's Pretty much the approved system in South Africa, um, but we have we can use we can adopt any approved fastener um, on our system. We we have done designs on with a Foslu mechanical fastener, um, which we might see a picture in the presentation. Um, to incorporate our resilience, we insert a continuous pad between the rail and the top of the module, so it fills that gap, and then. Um, you know, there's some more elasticity in the formation, which which free takes care of. So that's a typical representation of a module. It's the rail, um, the tie bars or gauge bars, as we refer to them, are spaced um, depending on our spacing. As a rule, we 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 run at one meter spacing, um, up to around about 22 tons. Uh, when we go above that axle load, we would then um, reduce our spacing maybe to a minimum of 850. We've never really gone below 850. Um, that module that you see there is a is a tangent module, straight module. Uh, once we go into the curves, uh, we'll go up to three tie bars. Um, if it's a tighter radius, maybe even four. But as a standard, we run three tie bars per six meters um, in a curve um, greater than or tied to then around about um, 700, 600 meters. Um, if it's a bigger radius, we'll still stick to two. Obviously, uh, side forces um, uh, play a role in the amount of gauge bars we would require. Um, it is, uh, like I said earlier, it's precast. And then uh, those two little pipes we see, it's a, it's a conduit. Uh, we can always also run a conduit right through the beams, which we can then um, uh, join at, at six meter intervals or whatever the length of the module is and we can run uh, signaling uh, fiber optic power cables um, and that uh, helps save cost in trenching or putting up poles to run uh, aerial cables. <clears throat> so the manufacturing process uh, would entail in general molds are designed and manufactured according to application. Um, all module the, the molds that we'll see a picture of it later uh, we can adjust uh, we use the same mold for tangent and curved modules by offsetting the components uh, along the center line um, molds will be molds will be set up in a manufacturing facility or on a level floor affixed to the floor um, on a we got a QA we got a quite a tight QA process every week we would check all the molds survey them make sure they level and within the tolerance before uh, casting is taken place um, each mold is charged with gauge bars, stirrups, geotextile bag, uh, reinforcing. Um, we then pump a small aggregate self-compacting concrete um, into the molds. We do not vibrate. Um, molds are generally left in under normal sort of temperatures ranging sort of from 18 to 23, 24 um, degrees. We would leave the modules uh, the, the modules in the molds for about 18 hours. We pump on a 24 hour cycle. So if we've got 20 molds, we pump 20 modules a day. Uh, we need to achieve around about six to seven MPA 
um, before we take the molds out with a special um, spreader beam. We did not turn them yet. We only turn them at about 20 MPA. Once we take them out, we stack them and we cover them and we cure them. Um, and then uh, when they're 28, uh, 28 MPA or 38, 30 MPA, we take them to site for installation. So on the left hand side, there would be a typical mold. Um, if you look at those, not the tie bar, not the galvanized uh, um, item, the, the green part, if we extend that center part between the two beams, that's where we can adjust the, <coughs> they, they, it's all laser cut, we can adjust the gauge. So we can go from uh, cape gauge 1065 to standard gauge to broad gauge, or any gauge for that matter, by simply removing those and putting them, putting a different set in. So on the left-hand side, that would be a, a, a empty mold. Once we've charged the mold, you can see all the galvanized components, the gauge bars, the stirrups, and so forth. And then um, the geotechnic, ge the geotextile bag, um, <clears throat> we typically use green. It can be any color. Uh, if the client wants a red bag, I suppose we can put a red bag in. Um, and then inside that bag is our reinforcing cage. So tubular track has got no casting items in the concrete at all. Um, if we need to replace a gauge bar, it's simple to replace a gauge bar. If we have a gauge bar damaged in the derailment, we then put in a tie bar between the first two stirrups or the alternating stirrups, and we just cut the existing tie bar out to maintain gauge. Okay, Frank. <coughs> so the the installation process um, is pretty simple. The, the, the geotechnical boys will uh, do the design and approve the formation. The, con uh, con the um, contractors come and build the formation to design. And all we need in the beginning to lay the modules is a surveyed center line. Um, as we place the modules down, we leave a 100 millimeter or four inch uh, gap between the modules. Um, those little conduit pipes, if, if it's an optional extra, they stick out about 30, 40 millimeters. So you can then thread your cables and stuff through. Uh, we then place the, the, the continuous pad on the, on the beams. As, as we lay the modules down um, on the center line, we, 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 we're within five to 10% uh, accuracy of the horizontal alignment. So once we put the, the pad on, it's not difficult to put on. Once we clip the rail on, it, it brings it in very close to horizontal alignment. Um, we then stick in the fasteners and the insulators, fix the rail onto the modules. Um, we then lift the modules uh, with rail jacks or a HDR machine or any other type of mechanical lifter, but it's very simple to do it by hand with uh, dedicated spreader, um, spreader bars. We lift it on an average of 80 millimeter above the top of formation. Um, we then do the final alignment, horizontal and vertical. We install shutters on the inside and outside of the beams, and we we um, introduce a a leveling grout concrete underneath, between the bottom of the module and the top of the formation. And then we re remove the shutters uh, the next day, and uh, the track is pretty much complete. Um, welding is 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 not difficult on tubular track. It can be exothermic or flash butt. Um, we can weld outside in long lengths and then do the uh, do the final welding once we've de-stressed and um, or it can be done by flash butt welding. So the top left hand picture, just uh, this is a, a typical uh, installation in the desert in Namibia. Um, we bring the modules to site and place them along the center line. Um, we then run, put the pad on, we install the rails, fasten the rails, and then um, do the final alignment, vertical, horizontal, hold it in place with wooden wedges, or there's some other means we can do depending on the installation. And then um, once that's finished, we can de-stress and do the final welding. So when when we start looking at, at the, the the cost comparisons, if we just compare it to to discrete support, which is ballastless uh, uh, track CBT sleeper track, 
Um, there's a saving on fasteners um, and insulators because our spacing on standard is one meter, not 650 or 600 or 700 millimeter. Um, our turnout, our turnout life uh, is 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 minimum twice times the turnout life on CBT. Um, our turnouts are also fully supported. There's a lot less bending and and uh, fatigue and all types of stuff that happens there. Um, the rails. On, on, a, on a initial project cost basis, because the rails are con because the system is continuously support, supported, uh, you can look at a lighter rail section and still get exactly the same um, life out of the rail due to the um, continuous support. There's just a lot less rail fatigue. Um, our wells do last longer because there's no bending; it's continuous support. Um, and then grinding, uh, Freya can respond on this a little bit. Um, it's still under evaluation. It's it it would be less, but we can't give a um, uh, in we can't we don't even want to put an indicative figure, but it will be less. Um, Freak, I don't know if you want to add anything there under the grinding. No, not at this stage. It's a little we yeah. little bit in the dark about grinding at this stage. Yeah. Um, just let me give you an example. If you go back there on grinding, we've done we did a balloon. Um, it's, it was opened in 2013 on, on uh, 150 meter radius uh, curve, very tight, continuously welded, 26 ton axle load, does about 1.8 million tons a week. And in the actual balloon itself, there are some rail defects, but it's more to do with the rail wheel interface um, than, than, than the system causing any rail defects, but minimal, and we know there's no grinding has taken place, and that's since 2013. That's about 80 million tons a year, gross tons. Okay, so in South Africa, um, we've got no high speed track in South Africa. The high speed track is the Gauteng train, which is on standard gauge. It's a one off, but um, on our normal Cape gauge metro, um, sort of top speeds rated at 120, but they don't do 120, it's 100 k's an hour. But uh, we're comfortable with 120. We've done designs for the UAE. A um, couple of years back on the GCC line at 160. Our current system as it is now, we're happy with 160 uh, kilometers per hour. Uh, we will just look at the pad. Uh, we'll look at the resilience of the pad and, and so forth. Um, we currently in South Africa run 26 ton um, axle loads uh, comfortably. Um, our, our piece of track in Saudi Arabia, which we finished in 2008, is doing 6 million tons a year. It's 32 and a half ton axle load on 54 kg rail hasn't been touched since 2008 um, and obviously in the mining and and um, some other smaller jobs we've done we, we, we run from five ton axle loads on 30 kg uh, 60 pound rail or, or 80 pound rail now our, our metros um, free run at what 18 and a half ton but when we do uh, metros we we go at 20 20 ton or 22 ton because Transnet uh, run freight through the stations um, after hours. So um, although it's Metro, we still put in 20 or 22 ton. Um, not that this, um, I don't think you got any deserts in Scotland, but it's just nice to show this. Um, when we did the piece of track in, in um, ballastless track is good for desert environment. Um, that piece of track we built in Saudi, that was after five years. I used to go and visit every year just to have a look at it. I don't go there anymore, I don't need to. Um, we get no ingress of sand between the rail and the top of the beam uh, where the pad is. There is no ingress of sand. Um, the pad is still performing extremely well. And that um, picture on the right-hand side is the, the new north-south railway line they built in in, in Saudi Arabia, which forms part of the GCC, but that's where the sulfate has been, um, um, uh, sorry, the phosphate has been um, exported, and this line hadn't been opened yet. Uh, when it was, large sections of this line when it was opened was already under speed restriction. Um, another major advantage of, of tubular modular track is the width of the formation. Um, even on standard gauge, we can come down to a formation width of, of 3.5 minimum. As a rule, we will design on four meters wide. Um, 
it's very difficult to cut at 3.5, but on the design, we only need 3.5. So when you do your numbers, you can work on four meters wide. Um, the layer works, we pretty much follow uh, the guidelines of the country we're going to work in. Um, we, we're happy with that. Uh, Freak will just run through it and see that he's happy from a geotechnical point of view. Um, but in South Africa, we follow the S410 specification, which is the Transnet specification. We've got no problem with it. Uh, when we do make adjustments, it's it's always a saving. Um, Freak might put in two layers or 150 as opposed to whatever they call. But um, the the layer works, we can assume for costing purposes, will be pretty much what you got. But the, the width is where the big saving comes. Um, on on at grade at flat um, there will be savings uh, of up to 40, between 35 and 40 percent. Um, in cuttings uh, there's still also big savings, especially on new projects. Uh, once we start going on full, obviously the the savings come down because there is less uh, saving on full. Okay, it's ballastless um greener footprint uh we don't need any of that um that you see there which which is what you would typically need for conventional ballasted track um so the only aggregate we need on site is the small aggregate for the for pumping into the beams and and the filler grout and that's it's it's minimal so tubular track has Definitely got a greener footprint. Um, it's more environmentally friendly. Okay, so as we all know, slab track, some European systems, um, in the in, anyway, in the context of South, South Africa, with our rand dollar exchange or rand uh, pound sterling exchange, is is phenomenal. We're running at about twenty. So slab track is very expensive. It's 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 in that range of. If we if we take a benchmark at one, it's two, three, four times more expensive than than conventional track. Um, from investment point of view, capital you know capital cost, capital project cost. Um, tubular track compares favorably to conventional track with capital project cost. Um, the bigger the volume goes. If we're going to do a one kilometer job, uh, we, we we might be a bit. More expensive than conventional track. If we do one platform of 300 meters, we might be a bit more expensive. But once we start climbing that ladder to 10, 11, 12, 13 kilometers and up, um, we start breaking the conventional track in the context of South Africa and Africa for that matter, and even the Middle East, even, um, um, and Russia and Canada, where we've done our sums. Um, from a maintenance point of view, uh, we all know conventional track does cost what it costs. And uh, slab track and T track, uh, due to being ballast, um, is 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 reduced maintenance up to half. Um, in South Africa, uh, we've got a number. We're comfortable that we're eighty percent, eighty percent cheaper. On on this is on the superstructure. I'm not talking formation and drainage that maintenance. I'm talking on the on the superstructure. Um, we can we're up to eighty percent cheaper in in maintenance cost. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit soon uh, earlier on rail size. Um, we can um, look at a smaller rail for the same application uh, when compared to, to conventional track. Um, fastness spacings can have a saving because we run at uh, four, four fastness per meter as opposed to um, 1.33 or 1.4, 1.5, um, um, you know, uh, more fastness per meter on CBT. Um, track geometry um, on site we don't need a fleet of engineers to install tubular track 50% uh, of the geometry if not more already comes in the module itself um, the the shoulders are, are spaced and um, you, you, you do a bit of bending on the rail in a curve and once you clip it on you 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 get your horizontal alignment pretty accurate so we we got less effort on site to to pick up geometry um in south africa we use no on on track machines for installation uh, we might use a hdr machine a little slewing machine just to do um, final uh, adjustment but uh, we don't need any rail bound um, uh, um, rolling stock or, or machines to 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 do the installation 
Um, in in Namibia, in the desert, we made our we got our own locomotive. We made some flat wagons because it was difficult to access the the, the line at, uh, in the desert um, at all points. There was no service road, so um, we had stockpiled areas about 10 kilometers apart, and we we stuck that onto a a, a, a on track machine just to get access to the site, not because we needed the machines just to get access to where we had to go and pump. Um, the volume of the superstructure, um, um, the mass per meter of tubular track versus the mass per meter of, of conventional track is, is um, very reduced. So you'll, there will be a, a huge saving in lo logistics uh, on project costing. And um, obviously in the layer works, there's, there's a, a lot less layer works to do because we run um, on three, three, to, three and a half to four meter wide formation as opposed to in South Africa, our Cape Gauge minimum with these uh, three, five comma five meters, I think. So yes. um, there's up to a 40% saving there as well. So on project costing, um, the, these are things that, that really um, have, a, have an effect and, and give us that opportunity to be cheaper than CBT once we start looking at 15 kilometer plus. Uh, the more the more the volume comes, the 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 greater the, the cost benefit to tubular track. And okay, the last point there, geometry loss. Um, we 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 don't the only time we can have geometry loss is is if if, they, if there's formation settlement or bad sections of formation. But otherwise, we, we, we got a pretty much fixed geometry system. So applications, we've been involved in mining, passenger, uh, sidings, loading facilities, uh, freight and main lines, heavy haul. Uh, we, do, uh, we do our own turnouts. Uh, we do level crossings. And everything is modular. Everything is precast. Um, this is an underground photograph from Russia, uh, 15 ton axle load, um, Freak 750 millimeter gauge. Yes. 750 millimeter gauge. Um, this particular project uh, is based on the Swedish uh, model. Um, it's going to become a fully, fully automated um, system um, uh, run from a, a office with a bunch of computers from Surface. And um, our partners there, Hencon Siberia, have teamed up with um, uh, some Germans and Dutch. And this level will become um, fully automated. It's a mine up in the Arctic Circle, just on the Arctic Circle, um, 100 kilometers from the Finnish border. And um, we, we import the components from South Africa, but all the modules are made, made in Russia and installed. Uh, this is from Canada. Um, it's in a nickel mine. Um, the mine is named after me, Craig Mine. Um, Glencore is the client. And um, one of the reasons they went for tubular track, uh, one of the many reasons is that it's also a trackless mine. So while they were mining, they had trackless vehicles uh, running up and down. And it's, uh, tubular track is very comfortable with um, pneumatic, uh, pneumatic wheel machines running over the track. So uh, there's a typical uh, turnout that we did. Um, we can do any turnout really. We just need the footprint of the turnout that, that the client will be using. Um, and then we will do the design for the molds and uh, Freak um, pretty much takes over that part of it. And, uh, but we, we've done various uh, types of turnouts. Um, uh, we, we, we can do any turnout really. Uh, this is a typical platform in South Africa. This is in Durban. Uh, this was built, this is uh, Quamashu Station. Uh, we did it prior to the World Cup, uh, Soccer World Cup in 2010. Um, so it's been going for 12, 13 years. Um, there's just been zero maintenance there. Uh, this is in Pretoria, also done uh, prior to the World Cup 2010. Um, and uh, we've maybe done a bit of skid mark welding and whatever because um, our, our rail Praza passenger rail agency of South Africa, <coughs> they lost their maintenance teams. They're non-existent. We can't find them. So we pretty much go and we don't like skid marks on, on, on our system. So we will always go and 
that's how we don't like skid marks. We're going to fix them. Uh, this is the open line uh, 20 ton in Namibia. Um, the total line is was built over two phases, uh, starting in 2006, 2005, 2006, and it's 75 kilometers long. Um, this track you're seeing now has still got the 1945 30 kilogram Krupp rail on, continuously welded. First time 30 kg rail has been continuously welded for 70 for this section 25 k's. And other people thought uh, it's not going to it's not going to stand the test of time. Um, I think there's been one rail break. Um, there's uh, 90,000 tons of uh, manganese going over from the Northern Cape in South Africa to Luderitz Harbour, um, and it's 30 kg continuously welded, no problems. Uh, this is the 32 and a half ton axolot uh, installation in Saudi Arabia running about 6 million gross tons a year. Um, finished this job the day before Ramadan started in 2008, and uh, we haven't touched the track since then. So a typical loading facility. This is, um, I think, mag uh, magnetite up at Paraboa. Um, so we can put in the center drain. Um, uh, the spillage is, is um, you can pick up all the spillage. Uh, you don't waste spillage. Um, so this is a typical 20-ton axle load con concept. Uh, this is a coal loading facility at uh, out in, in the Mpumalanga province of South Africa, where most of the coal collieries are. Uh, it's a twin line, center drain for, for the wet coal, the moisture seeping out of the wet coal and for rain runs downhill into evaporation dam for environmental purposes. Um, this installation has also been in 12, 13 years, uh, maintenance free. This is a wash bay uh, uh, out at Richards Bay, just uh, where they wash the wagons before they go back into the harbor to, to load product. Um, so it's easy to cast concrete around it to catch all the dirty water after washing and then into a sump and pump it out to be filtered and use for whatever. Okay, this is this is our flagship um, in, in my and Freak's opinion, I'm sure he agrees with me. Uh, this is the Ermelo uh, depot. Um, all the coal that gets exported from South Africa between 70 and 80 million tons a year um, gets collected at the um, countrywide um, in in that province uh, gets brought to the Ermelo in 100 wagon units it gets it, it then gets staged in D yard there where Freck is now showing it then gets pulled out in 200 wagon um, uh, consists of 80 tons per wagon gives us 16,000 tons per per train and then um, is brought around the loop into the next yard and then goes off to to Richards Bay now, now, this yard has got three three balloons. Um, the first two balloons come back through the 70s, 80s. Um, it's on conventional track at 220, 220 meter radius uh, uh, balloon. So uh, the maintenance uh, issues and the breakages and whatever you were just hectic for Transnet. Um, so in 2000 and 11 2012 they decided to build a third balloon so that they can always use two two balloons and one balloon will always be out for maintenance and they decided to build the third balloon on tubular track so uh this balloon on tubular track uh, on a good week can do up to 1.8 million um, tons of of, of uh, traffic and um, it pretty much all goes over tubular track This is the balloon. Um, so we've got a couple of lines there, the balloon, and then there's some staging yards. This is 26 ton axle load um, on UIC 60 rail, continuously welded, um, and uh, uh, 1065 gauge. That's the actual balloon, 220 meter radius, continuously welded. 
Um, I've been working, I've been doing tubular track for close to 30 years now, and I've never, ever, ever seen a kick out. Whether it's, um, and this, this, is, this is in Ermelo, it's very cold at night, very hot during the day. Um, it's a very strange town. This has got four seasons in the day sometime. Um, we've never had, we've never had a kick out on tubular track. This is a one in 12 uh, tangential, which um, we installed a couple of them at Tubular Track. This was still in the, uh, sorry, at Ermelo. Uh, this was still in the factory. Um, just an aerial shot. Uh, once we assembled the whole turnout, checked all the gauge and everything for QA before we dismantle it and put it on the back of a standard uh, uh, triaxle truck and it can be transported by road. Freak, just show where the where we can we can bolt the one leg off for it to fit on the standard road vehicle. Um, yeah, yeah. If you look at the right hand side on the on yeah, at the end of set, um, you can see that's a bolt on leg, bolt on leg. So um, it's fully modular and can stay fit on a standard um, a road vehicle or or a or a rail wagon if it needs to be taken to site, depending on the logistics. Uh, so that's pretty much the same turnout installed at at, at Ermelo. Okay, so this is our level crossing blocks. We have to pretty much conform to all railway standards. Uh, we need to, so depending on on the intensity of the traffic, you can just make a earth a earth. You just fill the tubular track with earth compacted, and you got yourself a a earth level crossing, or um, we can put our pre-module, our pre-cast uh, blocks in. We've got a type A block, a type B block, uh, because some of the blocks have to fit over the tie bar. Um, underneath the block, uh, we've got lintels. Um, I don't know what the terminology is that you will use. Um, we call them lintels, so it's just a supporting block. And um, there will be filler grout or concrete underneath the, the, the lintel. Um, there's a gap between the lintels, so we can still um, incorporate our center drainage. Um, the blocks are easily to remove to expose the rail for any maintenance or rail break or whatever you need to do. Um, but um, simple, once you've got your tubular track, you just place the blocks, um, place the lintels in. We've got a machine that aligns it, put the concrete in and place the blocks on top. Um, can I just mention here that we don't use the rail structure here any in any way to support the uh, uh, level crossing blocks so if the rail is slacking then the level crossing will still be good yeah in actual fact it doesn't it doesn't yeah the level crossing doesn't touch the track anyway the the superstructure okay so um, that's a level crossing at Ermelo. Um, one of the it was one of the construction photographs, and on the right hand side is is a level crossing at Bank Colliery. It's been in I don't know 15 years and still going strong. It's solid. So once the formation is finished, this is a picture from Brazil uh, for Vale. Um, 25 ton axolot free. I can't remember 25 ton. That's correct. One meter gauge. One meter gauge, 25 ton. Uh, the line on the right is uh, um, the Vale uh, freight line. Um, and um, we did a 1,8 kilometer uh, bypass here because they were having extreme problems with their ballasted track. Uh, I mean, I think the ballast in some cases was 700 millimeter uh, deep. Uh, they started having also problems with electrification. So once the guys are finished with the formation, they give us a center line. Um, you you pretty much get your your horizontal alignment pretty pretty close to to standard, and uh, then when you bolt the rails on, the alignment is not difficult to do. Yeah, this is a a high embankment curve in Namibia, um, which is which we open this section of the line opened in 2013 when we 2014 when we finished. Um, when we finished phase two. However, they were using this line to bring in the ballast because between the tuber track, the two phases, there's about 50 kilometers of, of conventional track where there's no um, 
um, uh, sand and um, other ballast contamination problems. The reason they did the first 25 k's on tubular track, the gradients were one in 50 and the radiuses were, that's a 200 meter radius curve. And um, then there's a straight section. And as soon as you get to Luderitz, which is the desert section, and there's moving dunes, they put in a ballastless system again. Yeah, so guys, thank you. Um, that's pretty much the basic introduction. Well, th thanks very much, Frick and Craig. That was that was excellent. Uh, it looks a really, really interesting system. And the photographs of the different installations worldwide was really impressive. Um, couldn't believe two key things that I picked up on. You kept saying maintenance free, which must be a total, a total joy, and also uh, never having had a misalignment. So that was that was kind of blew me away. Those two things. Um, we've got some questions on the on the chat. I'll just uh, run through with you if you're okay for that. Uh, Greg, can I just uh, correct myself there? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Maintenance free. Um, it's, it's significantly reduced maintenance. Uh, the, ma the maintenance is marginal. Um, yeah. yeah. If, 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 if the train, if, if the general rolling stock, look, we've always said there's, there's a, the two things that cause der derailment, bad geometry and bad rolling stock. So if your rolling stock is good and there's just the, the, the basic maintenance, the actual um, physical maintenance is, is significantly reduced. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, it still doesn't reduce the, the impressiveness of it, though. So, <laughs> thanks yeah, for that. Yeah, that's that word free. You know that word free. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Yep, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to run through some of the questions on the chat. <clears throat> um, so, Jim Watson was asking, uh, what was the comparison between stress-free temperature on the tubular track system and conventional ballasted sleeper track systems? Um. Um, we okay, we didn't we don't have a real number, but at at this stage, still when I worked working with Transnet, uh, my calculation showed that tubular track could handle about 25% higher temperature uh, change than conventional track. Okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. excellent. And and wherever I've been in the world, when I've de-stressed. Um, and obviously South Africa, I've, I always, we haven't got, I haven't got my own de-stressing temperature chart. I, I conform to the, the area chart for that area based on their temperatures. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, have some more here. So, um, Tom Wilson is asking offsetting components on the beam to account for curves. Is there a minimum radius limit? And for vertical curves, can this be done with a six meter with the six meter long units? Uh, yes, the, uh, regarding the vertical curve, six meters are still fine. Um, if we look at uh, that one picture of the of that one station, you can see the the vertical curve there. Um, in terms of horizontal curves. Uh, our feeling is around 150 meters is the limit, but we also need to reduce the module size because the rails are then climbing off the, the end of the modules if we don't yeah, do the that. Module length. <clears throat> okay, yeah, it's still incredibly tight, isn't it? 115 meters. Yeah, we can, yeah. We can fit a, we can fit 200 and like that Ermelo yard. Uh, Freak, those modules were six meters long, 220 meter yeah. um, radius. As soon as when the radius starts getting to 150, we'll look at the length of the module because then the the rail will start getting off the support part of the beam at the end of the beams. So on on the heavy haul, um, tighter curves, Freak will come down to sort of in the order of 5.4 meter meter modules. But we can we can handle tight radiuses. Yeah. Um, on the mining industry, we, we do we do thirty meter radius on a three meter module. And no no requirement for check rail or anything on that. We we have looked at check rail. Um, we got no check rail at Ermelo. It wasn't necessary. Um, um, Freak on our Aussie designs, we're looking at check rail. Hey. Um, that's correct. Uh... <coughs> Right. Uh, 
Yeah, we've looked at a few places to, to use check rails, but we'll, we haven't used one yet. Or we haven't got a radius that tight that we required uh, a check rail at this point. Very OK, and yeah. Just, and just as a matter of interest, the design we did for Esperance Balloon, which is on the table now for Australia, is 150 meter radius curve. And we looked at check rail, did the calcs, um, Freak's comfortable, we're comfortable, we're not going to put a check rail in. Yeah, impressive. <laughs> um, just got a few more questions there from Tom. So he's asking, uh, embodied carbon calculations, have the savings in embodied carbon from ballast excavation, machinery reductions, et cetera, have these been quantified for comparison with concrete or steel sleepers track form on ballasted track? Uh, mainly because you know all of our clients these days are really keen to take advantage of the the carbon reduction and the quest for net zero yes. and decarbonisation. Yeah. So we haven't, um, as Tubular Track P2I Limited, um, paid or done a detailed study. Uh, we've got a colleague in our group, Tubular Track Global, um, who actually took a a, a British. Um, a, a carbon footprint that was done for conventional ballasted track in the UK and he used that as a guideline and we worked on you know we we did a a tabletop uh, which we can send to you but um, it it is greener because uh, we will we will share that with you but we haven't done a formal one yet okay okay but but we need to do it um, in actual fact um, our colleagues in Australia um, we're looking. We're looking to get into a project in Western Australia, where we will get funded. Uh, we will pay half um, uh, through Tubular Track Australia, and the government will pay half. Western Australian government um, to the tune of eighty thousand um, Canadian, uh, sorry, Australian dollars, and we must pay the other half because we need to do that for Australia as well. They, it's, it's a hot topic there. Yeah, and we'll absolutely. Work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and on the, the, the Russian tunnel picture that you had the 750 mil gauge, um, Tom's asking why, why was the reason for the concrete infill between the tubes on that one? Um, that's what the mine wanted. So it's yeah. actually not a concrete in, infill. Um, when we cast the, the filler ground underneath the beam, we underneath the modules, we put an outside shutter and an outside shutter and we cast... <laughs> We cast it right through, so you've got a center drain as well. So any spillage um, from the wagons, you can you can go and sweep the spillage up and go and throw that, and you can recoup it because it is money. Um, yeah. And uh, then you've also got your center drain for water. Excellent. Yep. And um, another one there. G gauge bar position results in uneven uneven spacing i.e. closer at the module joints, does this create any issues? Um, just say it again, sorry. Just repeat that, please. Yeah, I'll maybe let Tom come off mute in case I'm picking it up wrong. She said the gauge bar position results in uneven spacing, which is closer <laughs> at, with the module joints. Does this cause any issues? Um, oh, just that. That, uh, it's not, no, it's, it's not uneven spaced. It's, it's, um, although the module is six meter or field field length is six meters and uh, uh, but the actual module is five and a half meter uh, uh, five point nine meters. yes so that hundred mil gap uh, is then then add, add that up the, is then the six six meter gauge and then for up to 22 ton axle loads, the, the spacing is one meters, and exactly. And then uh, for the heavy roll axle, it's 850. There may be a slight 10 millimeters or so, but it's, it's no, there's not an unequal spacing. It just looked yeah, like sorry. the spacing, the spacing between uh, the the gauge bar per unit give you an unequal spacing where the units join together in one of the yeah, no, no, it doesn't that do that. that we'll yeah, Frick, can you put that uh, 3D module on that um, second, third slide? I'll try again. 
So on the standard tangent module, you'll have two gauge bars and eight stirrups on a six meter module. The physical length out of the mold is 5.9. And then with a hundred millimeter gap between each of the modules, uh, you can add 50 and 50. So the field length per module is six meters. So on the tangent module, we'll have two gauge bars, eight stirrups, like that one, one, two, three, four. And then on a, on a, um, a tangent module, then you'll start with a gauge bar, stirrup, um, gauge bar, stirrup, gauge bar. So when you when you put your next module down, you put it in the right direction that you keep your two meter spacing. Because now the gauge bars are three meter spacing. If we put in on a curved track, it will go to three three gauge bars. But that 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 gauge bar in the second position will then come to the first position. And you'll have gauge bar, stirrup, gauge bar, stirrup, gauge bar, stirrup. And when you put your next module down, you put it down with a gauge bar. First, so you'll have two meters spacing between gauge bars. Okay, but when I look if at the picture, the picture on the bottom uh, right hand of that shot shows a gauge bar at the end of a module. If I put another yeah. module adjacent to that, I'm going to have a gauge bar adjacent to it. Uh, okay, it's not, right. so it's it's not, yeah. it's, it's not the spacing between. I yeah. understand in each module the spacing is even, yeah. but the space. The spacing yeah, between two modules, yeah. you've, you've got yeah, them gathered together it. at the joint, effectively. Yeah, Frick, that was 850 spacing, eh? Uh, no, this is also one meter spacing. Um, not, yeah, not, the, not the fastenings, the gauge yeah. bars. So, so, yeah, you, yeah no, I understand. Sorry, sorry, yes. Yeah, so in that application, you would have gauge bar. The spacing gauge bar then you would have two gauge bars on this design you'll have two gauge bars about about you know when you put the modules down you'll have a meter spacing between the two gauge bars one two three four five yeah six. and also that this was a special um test uh module for with the Vosler fasting system as well so yeah, this this yeah this was a test module we did that went to the um the German oh, this one, the, uh, Prasa, Prasa. Prasa. in 2017, yeah. Because obviously your 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 tie bars, your gauge bars are providing a rigidity that allows you to transport the module. Yeah, when we pick the modules up, we pick it up with a four chain sling or a purpose made uh, uh, spreader beam that hooks at the bottom of the gauge bar. So. You can't pick up a module that's got less than two gauge bars. So if we've got two gauge bars, we pick up on the gauge bars or yeah. a four chain sling at four points on the module. Yeah, that's fine. You've answered the question. Thank you. I'll check. Um, another one that was from you, Tom. Um, you were saying it looks like the level crossing blocks are braced against the rail and the web foot. This, any issues uh, caused by compacted dust or soil? Uh, I just want to go. Yeah, so, so we we fill that gap between the rail with a asphalt or a cement based sand mixture just to keep that gap closed. And if you need to, to take it out, you can practically scratch it out. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, another one here. Apologies if I've pronounced this wrong. It's, it, the wet Kruger is asking, um, considering what the, with the absence of ballast, there is also a loss of this resilience layer. What is the typical vertical track stiffness uh, static that can be achieved with the standard pad design? And what is the range that track stiffness can be tailored between? So there's there's about there's a kind of three questions in there. I'll let you I'll let you tackle the first one first. Um, what's the typical vertical track stiffness that can be achieved with the standard pad design? Um, the current measurements that we took is around um, 80 to 90 kilonewtons per millimeter. That's a little bit on the high side because you can't use that for high speed uh, uh, high speed track because that that require around 25 kilonewtons per millimeter uh, stiffness. Um, and then yeah, as also we have. Uh, 
a flexible formation design and not a rigid formation design that also takes some of the resilience. And then the beam is designed to take up a deflection around uh, three millimeters. Okay. So what would be the range of track stiffness you can cater for then? Um, I would say about from about 50 kilonewtons per meter to, to about 150 kilonewtons per meter, per millimeter, sorry, kilonewtons per millimeter. Yeah, excellent. And the, the last part of that question is, do you have different pad designs to cater um, for different stiffness? At this stage, we've got two manufacturers. Um, the one is the, um, what's the UK one, <laughs> Tyflex, uh, and the other company, uh, okay, and Tyflex are relatively, uh, have a relatively stiff pad. Um, that's a rubber bonded cork type of uh, pad. And the other company is Gexner in Austria, and their their pad stiffnesses can be manufactured or um, engineered a little bit uh, lower stiffness or harder stiffness depends on the uh, application. Uh, yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, one from Richard Brown is asking, um, has tubular track the flexibility to satisfy changing business requirements? Fallacy track is very suitable where track layouts may need to be altered to suit expanding traffic needs, for example. What is the comparison between the two systems in this respect? Greg, are you going to take this one? Sorry, just please, please uh, just repeat the question. Yeah, so it's all about um, does tubular track have flexibility to satisfy changing business requirements? For example, fallacy track is suitable where track layouts may need, may need to be altered to suit expanding traffic needs. So how how does tubular track compare in terms of flexibility with fallacy track? For um, changing the layouts, for example. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, um, it's Friday um, evening. No, it's, 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 the, it's a very difficult one to, uh, to answer because we're actually a little bit of a, in terms of the flexibility, more rigid type of system. So, um, yeah, we, there's a few positions that we can't use it. And I think something like uh, scissor crossings and things like that, where there's a very, complicated um, network of rails coming together and, and trucks and switches um, that's a little bit difficult to design for such uh, for su um, such a type of uh, layout sure. yeah. yeah if that's sort of what the can question I come is in there, please can I come in there please sure Richard yeah absolutely um, the, the point I'm trying to get at is uh, uh, ballasted track systems uh, really uh, have a great advantage over many other track systems in this particular respect, which is often ignored by engineers, if I may say so. Engineers look things from a purely engineering perspective. If you're a business manager, you're thinking about, well, okay, for the next three years, having this track with this turnout here and so forth is what we want, but the traffic needs may change in three years' time. And I'm not sure from what I've heard that tubular track is suitable for those sort of situations, which is very prevalent in Britain. You know, we've changed, if I, if I think over my career, the number of times the track track layouts have changed, double tracks gone to single, singles gone to double, new crossovers, new junctions, all sorts of things. And this is really fundamental because it's about what does a business requirements need? And I accept that in, in certain situations, tubular track can have really, really good uh, contribution to, to the business, but I'm not sure it would in the sort of situation we are in Britain. But it'd be interesting to know what you think. Okay, um, yeah, all right, I understand the question a bit uh, more. Okay, so uh, what uh, Freak was alluding to earlier is, is if you have sort of a bunch of things coming together, uh, you can still. Um, um, if I understand the question properly, you, you can still leave some stuff on ballast because um, we've got 
we've got good design trans transitions where we can go from tubular to ballast. Um, and in in all cases, tubular track can be taken out, stockpiled, and reused. Like you know, used somewhere else. Um, if a, if if a track layout had to change, um, you can take straight modules out and replace them with curved modules. So, um, but but I agree with you uh, from a ballast point of view. It is more um, flexible in 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 that regard. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. That answer. Okay, thanks. Um, next, there's uh, just a comment from Tom that I would I would agree with. He's, he's just saying that this, this track form would be a fantastic solution for track lowering in conjunction with new electrification schemes, and uh, he's saying it needs to be presented as an innovative solution to interested parties like Transport Scotland. I would, I would agree with that. I think it would uh, it would be of great interest. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jim's asking, uh, have you any evidence on the increased life of cast crossings through continuous support? Um, at this stage, we haven't done, except for rail, um, rail bound manganese crossings um, that we estimated on the co-line, uh, the life is about two to three times more than conventional ballasted tracks uh so it's on the same position okay okay that's actually our only case study in south africa sure yeah yeah uh, we've got one last question on the chat and then i think we can go to uh, open up the mics uh sorry two more sorry so uh, tom's asking does the continuous strip pad have a lip on both sides of the rail foot to prevent lateral migration no, no, it doesn't. Okay. The rail, the rail pad width is determined. Um, it, 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 it will not walk out. We've never had rail pad walk out um, as, as a rule. Um, the width will, the will basically butt up to practically. Um, does the does the bottom of the insulator go past? It doesn't go past the rail foot. Yeah, it goes. Uh, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, right. in, in, yeah, but with the HTP pad on the mine, it does, but on surface, it doesn't. But uh, uh, we haven't got a lip, and the, and the pad does not walk out. The friction is just too much for it to walk out. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, another one from Duet Kruger again. Um, if used as an alternative for more conventional slab track applications, where base plate rail fastenings are normally used to, amongst other things, achieve vertical rail adjustment. How would this be achieved with tubular track? Um, this is a difficult one. Uh, yeah. One thing you, you can do is you can uh, regrout the system again to get the lift, or if you, your lift is not that much, you can lift and uh, place a small uh, grout layer yeah. again between the current uh, grout and the formation or between the beam and the, and the grout layer to achieve the uh, realignment basically yeah okay yeah so so in brazil we had an incident like that we had a bit of a settlement and all we did was we we then jacked the top of the rail very simply um i'll send you guys photographs um, if you request um you just lift it with bottle jacks and like Freak was saying we had a five six millimeter gap and we we pumped um uh, cementitious grout you can also pump epoxy grout in there if it's not a big distance but you can realign great okay that that was all the questions in the chat i'm just gonna hit unmute to everyone so f feel free if anyone wants to ask any further questions you just unmute yourself it should work and uh, you can ask ask away we'll give a Few more minutes for any further questions. You know me, Greg. Always questioning. Great, um, great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just, I just hit the button as you said. We're going to close it. So it was about never real product acceptance to, to my mind. Um, you know, never real need to be aware of this innovative product. The RSSB need to be aware of this innovative product. Mm. I've been a big fan of it for many years. And I spoke to Peter Kussel, I was in correspondence with Peter many years ago when I wanted to use it 
the very first time in Australia on a particular project I was working on at the time. But until it's accepted here in the UK, and the best way to do that is have a product acceptance certificate behind you, yeah. your kind of hands are tied because even if you do produce this to, to like Transport Scotland, the Bill Reeve says, what a great piece of kit, I want it everywhere. You know, you've got this, well, hang on a minute, it's not, in, it's not something that a designer can reach for as a track form. And yet it has an ideal place in areas where we've got uh, poor stiffness, perhaps, where transom track works better than any other track form. And especially for track lowering situations where instead of having to do something like uh, a, a, a bracing beam between the, the apartments, you can use this track form. And because it's very shallow depth, you can just dig out what's there, lower the track to what you need and put this track form in. Yeah, and that's the yeah, yeah. so product. So the question is, are you going to seek product approval from Network Rail? Any aspirations in that aspect? Uh, I, not at this stage. I, I don't. I and don't is that because the, the, there are markets elsewhere that are keeping you busy, or is no. there? You, I mean, it's such an innovative thing. That there's, there's money available in this country for innovative products. And if this isn't an innovative product, I don't know what is. Yeah. So we see composite plastic sleepers being installed by Network Rail to a great big fanfare. I would like to see more steel sleepers, obviously, because that's my name, Tommy Steel. And <laughs> to get to that situation where you've got another alternative track form that in the right situation, I know we don't have deserts here, but we do have particular conditions, uh, not least of which is heavy rain periods, where the track form itself would be eventually become the drain. And that there's so yeah. much so much going for this product, I just think it, it really needs pushed in this country. No, I think we will need help in 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 yeah. in a approval to the network rail what is the process to get that going um to get a uh, tubular track approved that time in south africa um which we started in 93 90 well even before that free 92 you were still at the track test center um yeah. tubular track went through intensive uh, laboratory testing and infield testing to get uh sporting net approval to have it put into our network um, so we've we've been down that road, but what 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 would be the uh, you know how would you start? Is there is there a process you you? you oh yes, um, that's, <laughs> there's a network real process for it, and and that kind of thing you're talking about is all good background information. So has it been installed anywhere else in the world? Yes, tick that box. Yeah. Is it is it good for heavy haul? Yes, tick that box. Can I use it when I need a low a low um, design height track form yes tick that box all of that stuff and then you'll go through the usual you know does it conform to en standards in terms of the pull out tests or the fastenings and all the other stuff that goes along with it but it is a it's a road that you have to travel i think if you want to get it involved in the uk rail industry and i think there was at least four markets in the uk rail industry not all of which are network rail yeah, there are, other, there are other infrastructure operators that would welcome this, and I'm thinking, well, Glasgow Underground. Here in Glasgow, we've got an underground railway system. Do they have issues? Yes, they do. Would this system benefit them? Yes, it would. So that's that's an an interest, and they have a unique gauge. They've got a one meter gauge. So your your mm. material could be produced at one meter gauge very simply. There you go, there's, there's a unique track form. It would suit your environment in the tunnels. It's modular. We can take it into the tunnel. All of that good stuff that goes with this. There's another marketplace other than the network rail. Yeah, I, th I think the fact that it's been used around the world, you know, as you said, Turner, it ticks a lot of boxes immediately, but the, sometimes the best way when it were real to start the product approval process is just to install something as a as a trial site, you know, and it could have enhanced inspections on it or whatever the conditions are just to just to make sure it's okay. But 
it would certainly it's not it's not first of its type uh, around the world. It's first of its type maybe in UK, but you know it would certainly be good to get it going as a, a trial site even somewhere. Yeah. I know that when the DFT approached us as a design company and said to us, we're looking at for low cost track forms that we could put in areas where you might not be able to get a normal track form designed. The very first thing I, I said to them was, have you heard of tubular modular track? And the general answer is no. So there's an awareness issue. So you need, obviously this is what you're doing today. You're raising awareness of the product and that's fine, but that, that product awareness needs to extend outwards, word of mouth, however it's done. The publication in the PWR journal was a good way to do it. And people will start to talk about it, but if you actually have a site, and it may be as a, you know, someone in Wales, where you have a non-network rail operator, you have a potential metro system in the Cardiff Welsh Valleys thing, and you've produced a new track form that suits that environment, and because they don't have to, uh, you know, it's not network rail approval required, it's just that particular uh, infrastructure owner approval required, they can say, okay, we'll take a go at this and we'll install it. So there are, there are places that you could be pointed towards if you want to market this in the UK and be successful, and not least of which is the RSSB and through their innovation forums and say, you know, we've got this thing, we've used it elsewhere in the world, but I understand in the UK, it's a very innovative idea. And you might get funding to do that, funding to uh, promote it, funding to install a trial site, because all of that will add uh, credence to what you've showed in the presentation today, that it's an absolute great system because it goes all the way back to Brunel and is continuously supported transom track. Yeah, I, I propose... Andrew Anderson installs it in Bowness and Keneal first as a trial site, and then we can learn from that. <laughs> we have a little renewal going to happen in January next year. It's not very, very, very far. But that would be a good place to put it, Jim, wouldn't it? I, I, think, I think Andrew might uh, face some uh, stiff opposition in putting it in at uh, <laughs> Bowness in that it's not traditional Scottish of railway course. engineering. Course, yeah. uh, however, uh, I have to say, you know, this is going back to Brunel was right. Longitudinal bearers, whether they're timber or concrete, it's good. It works. Uh, and it's absolutely crazy that in the UK, uh, not Scotland, but, but elsewhere in the UK, we're, we're, we're saying we're going for light rail. We're going for light rail and we're putting in G44 sleepers on 300 millimetres of ballast, and the food then sends it to the rail. So, uh, what we should be looking at is, is something like tubular track or, or a similar system. Correct. We need to get away from beam and elastic foundation stuff and go with continuous support to a rail, reduce the poundage of rail, go from 60 kilogram rail down to 54 or even smaller, and get, and get that kind of thing as a... You know, the, the thing you reach for, the track form you reach for, you have more uh, track forms in your recipe book other than G44s and Sen60 rail. Mm -hmm. That can only happen through engagement with the infrastructure operators, Great British Railways, as they'll become, and other places like uh, East London Railway that don't form part of the national network. They run a metro. The, um, the Welsh Government are going to transport for Wales, they're going to run their own metro in the Cardiff area, up the valleys, and this would be an ideal track form to install in areas like that and say, look how good we are, look how environmentally friendly we are, look how much embodied carbon we've saved in this new railway that we've built. And that's where you need to concentrate your selling points, not just that it's a great track form, but it's an environmentally friendly track form and it'll help the users get to the net zero target. It, it, Andrew Anderson here. Um, I kind of couldn't let that pass without comment. Um, but the wheels are going round here to work out, is there anywhere it could be shootable on the Bowness line? So I'm certainly thinking about that. Um, 
it, it would be a sell to the traditionalists if there was somebody of Scottish descent who was involved in its development. And I'm sure if we look far enough back, there'll be somebody somewhere. Um, uh, perhaps one thing, the, the comparison with Brunel, I was wondering about as well, because one of the problems with his track was it was on piles, which meant it was discrete supported and therefore presumably be behaved rather lumpily. Uh, presumably that's less of a problem with this because we're going on to a uniform support at a similar depth and formation. It's not being supported discreetly. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, it's uni uniformly supported. Yeah. But we need a quite a good um, sub ballast layer on to yeah. install the system. Otherwise, you're just going to have pumping so that we've learned also. Okay. Thank you. I think what would be a quite quite useful would be a comparison. I uh, going down the carbon terms. I uh, we've just had COP twenty six in Glasgow, and um, to paraphrase somebody who, who whose name I'll not say, uh, blah blah blah. Uh, <laughs> we've. Uh, we, we, we've talked tonight about the volume of concrete, the volume of aggregates. That's a comparison that needs to be made. Uh, how much aggregate are we saving by going down a, a, the, the road of a system such as this rather than conventional ballasted track? Because there's a, a huge amount of a uh, quarried stone goes into ballasted track, whether it's the track ballast itself or the concrete bearers and sleepers. Something to think about, something to chew over. Uh, we're talking about climate change. We're talking about moving forward. Uh, let's think about that, guys. These days, Jim, Group 3, we as the designers of Group 3 are asked to provide the embodied carbon quantities for everything we've designed. Now, Group 3, when the design alignment's not quite fixed, quite tricky, but we do our best effort. So I've just designed Yealy North Junction, double junctions to dive on all sorts of stuff. The embodied carbon in that double junction is huge. And that's in both the volume of spoil removed, the volume of new ballast required, and everything else that's associated with it. The machinery to install it, the logistics of getting the stuff to site, and we should really be looking at asking ourselves the question as engineers, every single 50 millimeter crystal of ballast, do I have to take the old crystal ballast away? Is there something wrong with it? And my new crystal ballast, do I have to bring it to site? Do I really need it? And when you get a product like this that uses no crystals of ballast and might require a bit of track bed treatment that you can see quite readily on the ground below the tubes, why wouldn't you want that? Because the embodied carbon savings must be huge in this. Yeah. I, I have I have to agree with you there, Tom. Uh where, where the whole thing falls down is if you look at the RS uh, SB uh, carbon calculator, is that they don't differentiate, for example, between uh a piece of steel that's produced in the UK in a plant that's uh, reasonably environmentally friendly and, and something that's produced in, say, China uh, and shipped halfway around the world. But the, 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 the whole carbon calculation, as it stands, is a bit of a fallacy. And, and, and here we have uh, a product that can be produced locally with a relatively, uh, a relatively small carbon footprint. But unfortunately, the tools that we have at our disposal just now, it's difficult to prove that. Yeah. I think you can guess, Craig and Rick, that we're quite, <laughs> we're quite positively supporting your product because the audience here tonight has, has been, I guess, kind of blown away with some of the pictures. A picture speaks a thousand words, and we look at it, and you think. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you just want that? It, it prevents so so many advantages. You know, never I never need to put a tamper near it. Well, bring it on. Yeah, no, um, guys, it's really 
very interesting to listen to the discussion amongst yourselves. And just uh, um, when we uh, when we did our little comparisons, um, which we're going to open that chapter up again and start working on it. I'll get all of the Aussie guys. The impact is even greater on the carbon on the that embodied carbon quantities when you go to standard gauge because when we move to standard gauge, the increase in the steel is just one four three five minus one oh six five. The beam size stays the same. Everything stays the same. The the increase is is absolutely minimal. So it will have even a bigger um, uh, carbon footprint saving. Um, on, on standard gauge because even even the formation width stays the same on uh, cape gauge and standard gauge which is three and a half or, or maximum four meters um i think um listening to this discussion we need to um if if tom um or jim um we need to get the ball rolling for network rail to get that that um, um approval whatever it is um going and and um, if there's a private guy in the industry that uh, is off the network that can put a test piece in um, that's what happened in saudi arabia and um, the guys in uae we nearly got that phase two job but you know there was some internal politics there we were side of the big australian company and a local uae company but um, they made a big mistake because they they got sand mitigation problems but um, it, it would be nice to to try and Get a private guy on a private line to put in a test track. Well, at That's least a, a sample track. That that will take off quicker than going through the network rail um, formalities. But first thing you have to do is, is just find out in the UK who are the operators that know network rail connected. And I'm thinking Nexus Rail, Transport for Wales, East London Railway, uh, SPT, Glasgow Underground. There's there's lots of them, not not least of which is the, the preservation societies like the Bones and Keneal, which is a, a preserved railway line. These are off the grid. In other words, they don't have to comply with Network Rail's product acceptance. If you have a Network Rail product acceptance, it's easier for them to install, part of their safety case. But all you have to say is, does it comply with GCRT 5021, the track system requirements in the UK? And if the answer to that is yes, it holds gauge, it doesn't develop twist, it does this, it does that, and complies with 5021, then you're three quarters of the way there. Yeah. Your track form is then ready to be accepted by the infrastructure operator. And I, I fully agree with that comment made, you know, everything comes across the oceans in ships and everything, that 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 doesn't never get taken into account. With tubular track, all we bring is the geotextile bag, The we can even make the components locally, um, under we we can uh, appoint a uh, um, an engineer who works under license to us to manufacture the components. Um, we'll do a comparison of making them here, putting them on the ship and taking them there. If we can make it cheaper there, we do it there. Uh, we bring in the molds, the geotextile bag, um, the pad comes from just around the corner of the UK, and everything else is local. And you need to talk to people in the UK that promote innovation like the RSSB, and the RSSB have got innovation uh, grants and funding available, or can make that available. And you say, this is what we've invented. It's been going around the world, it hasn't got to the UK shores yet, but we'd like to introduce it to the UK. Can you help us do that? And see what reaction you get. And I think the people will be biting your hands off. Well, can we do that through your team, the PWI, or? Can there be individuals on this talk that can guide us and in that direction that we can make contact with them? There are individuals on this discussion tonight that have, that can make that happen, uh, and and people you know. So Mark, Mark Campadonic from uh, WSP in Guildford is on the call tonight. Uh, I believe that freaks worked with him in the past and. That could Actually, be yeah. an, old, an old friendship rekindled. And with Mark's help and with my help, we can put you in contact with the people that need to hear your story. Yeah, definitely, Tom. Yeah. I think we know what we're thinking of, but um, yeah, it'd be yeah, great yeah. To, to have that conversation after. Freaking we don't, uh, WSP don't always design for network rail. We have 
clients that are known network rail clients who would be interested. And I'm thinking of a particular track form I was asked to design in a weird situation, but to get rid of nuclear waste in this country, uh, they wanted to dig a tunnel and evaporate rock under the sea, uh, put in a track form, put in the uh, containers of uh, nuclear waste, and then allow the tunnel to collapse on itself. And they were looking for a track form that wasn't very deep, maybe didn't require ballast, and would fit in a tunnel situation. And I can't think, I think what we've just seen tonight describes that ideally, and that would be of interest to even people in the nuclear industry who are not, their main job is not running trains. And that's a railway that would, that would satisfy that need to bury nuclear waste in a tunnel three kilometres down, three kilometres out. Guys, I'm just conscious of the time, maybe we should uh, sort of bring the formal part of the meeting to a close and then we could stay on. Uh, I could stop the recording, we could stay on for a further discussion, anyone that wants to, but um, I'm just keen to, to to finish off this section. So I'm just wondering, is there any, any further questions from anyone? No, nope. all good. Um, in that case, I think I'll just close out by asking if we can ask Jim to give the vote of thanks uh, on behalf of the section. Yeah, okay, Greg. Uh, Craig Prick, thank you very much for taking uh, your time out this evening uh, to talk to us. Um, firstly, may I take the rather painful opportunity uh, of congratulating the box for their win on Saturday at Murrayfield, the best team did win. Now, I should be able... <laughs> Thank you. Not, not at all. It's a pleasure, Craig. I was there, and yet yeah, the best team did win. Now, Tribular Track, it's an innovative, yet simple, ballasted, a ballast-less, sorry, track forum. Sadly, not one that is particularly well known in the UK or Europe. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it, not just uh, for implementation, but by UK and European designers. And it, it's something that it really should be. I, I can see uses in uh, metro and light rail, where, as I, I said earlier, uh, in this country, we, we're still thinking about G44s at 600 millimeter centers and send 60 rail for light rail. No, 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 that, that, that's just not on. Uh, and of course, in places like freight complexes, I was interested to hear you talking about uh, its use at 100 mile an hour or 160K. Uh, that's certainly uh, something, something worth exploring. Uh, the, the catalyst for, for, for this evening's uh, presentation uh, from my point of view, I uh, was me recalling seeing tubular track being used on a mixed use line adjacent to to the How train, uh, where both Frick and uh, and I were working at, at that time. Goodness me, eleven years ago, how time flies. Um, yep. And and my thoughts at the time was, what on earth is this? Why has it been put in? Uh, Good stuff. I uh, interestingly we, we've touched on economy and the carbon footprint, very 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 uh, important in, in today's world. Um, the use of construction plant was mentioned, uh, and cost savings. Unfortunately, in the UK, the minute you attach the word rail to anything, the cost goes through the roof. But yeah, here here we have a system that can use predominantly a uh, conventional construction plant. So here's economies right away. Uh, savings in, in mass per meter, great stuff. Reduced maintenance, in fact, almost maintenance free. Uh, what really has fascinated me tonight is the the thought of modular SNC uh, with continuous support on both switches and crossings. This is something that I think in the UK we really, really need to explore. Uh, 
I've listened to various uh, presentations at the PWI uh, about uh, past manganese crossings and how we need to reanalyze re the stresses within them, how we need to look at respacing bearers under them. Well, here's the answer. Continuously support them. Absolutely great. Um, cable ducting within the track system. Oh, absolutely great. That is, that is a really, really good innovation that needs to be taken forward. Uh, I suppose at the end of the day, what we're saying is Brunel was right with uh, longitudinal timbers, longitudinal bearers, longitudinal concrete bearers, uh, uh, and a modular system. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a bit difficult these days uh, because we're all talking remotely, but I would uh, ask uh, my fellow members to join with me in uh, thanking our presenters in the usual way. Thank you very much, guys. Well done. Well done. Thanks, thanks, Jim, for that. I, I'm just going to close out with just a reminder again to those that missed it. The, the next meeting for Glasgow will be the Wednesday, the 15th of December, um, and it's high, out, high output trackside drainage remediation. Um, I'm just going to stop the recording there, but uh, we're welcome to, to stay on um, as long as we like after that.